America is a country at war in the world. President Obama entered office pledging to end the military conflicts of his predecessor, George W. Bush. He leaves office having presided over the longest period of conflict of any U.S. president, the only one to have served two full terms with the nation continuously at war. By 2016, U.S. special forces were in 70 percent of the world's nations. While Obama reduced U.S. soldiers fighting in Afghanistan and Iraq, he massively expanded air wars and special operations forces globally, including drone strikes outside the declared battlefields of Afghanistan and Iraq, mainly in Pakistan and Yemen. Obama authorized over 10 times more drone strikes than George W. Bush and essentially designated males of military age in these regions as combatants, making them legitimate targets for remote-controlled killing. Terrorism has spread, no wars have been won, and the Middle East is consumed by more chaos and divisions than when candidate Barack Obama claimed his opposition to the invasion of Iraq. Since drones account for only a small proportion of explosives dropped in the past eight years, civilians killed by Obama's bombs could number thousands. But it is hard to know because the administration and mainstream media have been virtually silent about the civilian toll from failed interventions. How many bombs has Obama authorized? And under his presidency, how many countries have US military forces deployed in? Simple questions with important answers. He leaves office having been in conflicts longer than any president in US history. What does this say to the world about the office he inherited and his legacy as a president? We put that to the American public. And I think because of his politics and his uh, strength in some areas and his passivity in others, I think he uh, probably prolonged it a little bit longer. And if he had just come in there and said, look, we need to tell our troops to, here's your objective, make it happen, and let's get this thing over with and have clear-cut objectives. I think uh, from the beginning of the war, we didn't have a clear-cut objective. We just wanted almost a little bit of payback for what happened to us on 9-11 and anybody that may pose a threat in the future, and we got ourselves into a pretty big mess by doing that. Well, I think that he inherited a pretty bad situation, and I think that he just did the best that he could to kind of get us through, and I think he did a really good job, and I'm honestly really sad to see him go. You know, I, I think it says a lot about the time period that we are in our world. There's a lot of turmoil going on um, abroad, as we can see in the Middle East or uh, in Western, Eastern Europe, excuse me. Um, and so I just think it speaks more to the condition of our world more than the condition of his administration. Well, him as a president, I really believe he really tried to do the best he can. Uh, since Congress, you know, was, you know, holding his, you know, there was, wasn't willing to work with him, in my opinion. But I really think he did a good job. I mean, he, he kept the uh, nation safe for eight years. We didn't have any major incidents, you know, and most of it was pretty much domestic. So I really believe he did a good job. It says everything about weakness. He is leaving office, leaving this country and its foreign policy and its defense weaker than it has been in generations. The wars in the Middle East, especially, especially Syria and Aleppo, that he completely ignored virtually in terms of any kind of U.S. power, turned U.S. foreign policy into a paper tiger. I think what it says about the office inherits, now the office inherits is obviously it's just the kind of, it's the front office of the US superstructure, which is a colonial imperialist state. So Obama represented, uh, the eight years of Obama represented the US imperialist kind of presence on the planet according to its historical place at, at, at this moment. So this moment was about delivering the destruction of the Middle East, that's clear. The last eight years, North Africa and the Middle East, after the work of Bush Jr. has kind of, quote unquote, completed the job. And that's where Obama wanted to pivot to Asia. Obama said, look, we've done the Middle East. Let's go to East Asia now, i.e. China. So the job was done. 
was the destruction of Libya, near, the near destruction of Egypt, the basic destruction of Tunisia, the destruction of uh, Syria, the destruction of Yemen. This is all under Obama's watch. And so it's a continuation and an escalation from the Bush years in, in a lot of ways. And then after Obama, we're going to see a, a further intensification of that as well. All right, with regards to the office he inherited, he's inherited two big messes. Uh, one would be post-war planning for Iraq, and the other will be current entanglement in Afghanistan. So even though he's got involved in seven countries, he's inherited a mess in terms of it's expensive and he can't just withdraw from either of those countries. So you can't really blame him for those two. Uh, with respect to what he did himself, he didn't break away from George Bush's policy. And George Bush was a warmongering president. You know, it's, it's quite often that people are mentioned that George Bush is guilty of war crimes, even in America. And Obama had a chance to break away from that. You know, when he came into power, everyone was talking about his progressive credentials. And you could see there was really no change. All that happened was he did things quieter. So even with Libya, uh, you know, the media would have shown Cameron and Sarkozy coming in triumphant. So he took a back seat, but he was still doing insidious things uh, in other countries. Under Obama, how many countries does the public think currently have US military forces deployed? The answer is 138. How do people feel about that? And why is the number so high? I think, uh, you know, we should probably uh, focus on on uh, promoting peace and, and coming up with political solutions and using war as a, as a last means. Well, I guess it depends on, we try to have less military on the ground. And, you know, he, as you can say, we try to make sure that, you know, we don't have to use a lot of troops. Uh, to keep everyone safe, but I really believe the reason why it's probably so high is because the threat now, the, the ISIS, even though they are retreating back, of course, you know, once you leave the troops there, they will come back and take over the territory they gained. I think that number is high because of the amount of global tensions that the U.S. has and also just political relations. I know it's very intricate how the U.S. Um, deals with certain things, especially, you know, with treaties and um, just the overall global climate. So I'm sure, I mean, it's more, probably more difficult than I can comprehend to understand. The Obama foreign policy has been so reticent and so inclined to withdraw from any kind of really hard-nosed defensive posture, especially in the Middle East, where the, the political and the military actions are so dire that uh, he's leaving office with a very, very sad legacy, in, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I don't think was, there's no, I don't think too high is the right word. I mean, we're over there doing good things in Haiti, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and we're, I mean, we're doing nation building in both of those countries, which I think is a great thing. I mean, it wastes, you know, it's a lot of money, but it, we're helping the people there. You know, deployed isn't, you're kind of saying it isn't a bad word. But to me, the deployed is just, you know, for just being there. There's nothing bad about being deployed. Um, I'm not surprised about the expanse of military bases of the United States. Also, France and, and Britain is, is, is up there as well. And obviously, there's a close strategic cooperation between London and Washington. Uh, Washington is like the armed wing, and uh, London is like the financial and kind of sophisticated colonial wing of it. So what I feel about that, it's a, it's a gross injustice. And it's, uh, it should be one of the leading global struggles, actually, uh, and campaign issues of people to remove all Western bases, including Britain, France, and the United States, from our homelands. It's not a live issue. It is not a campaigning issue. And I think we should be developing for it to be an issue. And I think someone like the Press TV can, uh, uh, can play a leading role in helping to inspire and facilitate that. I don't judge America in negative terms just due to that number. They'll say they've got the ability to project power in terms of military presence all over the world. So if you look at uh, the dispute between China and Philippines in the uh, South China Sea, the, pre the mere presence that America have got, let's say, in a base in the Philippines, it'll protect potential interests. 
So I'm not really saying it's a negative thing for him to have so many bases. The only caveat would be uh, Cuba in 2013 said they would like uh, the uh, Guantanamo Bay, which was originally a naval base, to not be there. But all these countries, the 138, aside from Cuba, they're given America consent to have their bases there. So in their sort of mission for force spectrum control, that's just a part of the plan. But it's still a better option than the idea of projecting um, actual military weapons all over the world. So it's just the present, so that's how I feel about that. In 2016 alone, how many bombs does the public think Obama authorised? It's over 26,000. Why, in the public's view, is the US so uniquely violent? I think it's, uh, as far as the number of bombs, I think, uh, you know, the whole idea with the smart bombs, you know, there's nothing smart about them. It's just, uh, uh, it is something that can't be filmed live. I think that that number would be dramatically lower if the same uh, news cameras and things like that would show what would happen. I think the technology that he's using is, you know, is better, well better, because you don't have to send people out that lose their lives. You just use a drone to take out what we need to do instead of using a whole troop, you know, to come in there and take over. I don't think it's uniquely violent. I think the world is violent. I think um, those issues come into hand. I think policy is driven by a lot of different people, not just the president. I think it has a lot to do with the intricacies of um, the relationships between, you know, so many different countries. Uh, violent? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, once again, I think that we have huge influence around the world and sometimes to defend uh, your interest, you have to use military force. <laughs> in our opinion, uh, he did not drop enough bombs in the right place. Uh, they have drones dropping bombs to take out individuals and so forth. But he should have been dropping more bombs in Aleppo in defense of the Syrian uh, freedom fighters. The U.S. is so uniquely violent because the United Kingdom passed the baton uh, shortly after the Second World War to the United States. So that which the, Brit uh, the British were doing and doing into the 50s and 60s and into the 70s, let's not forget uh, Malay, let's not forget Aden, uh, modern day Yemen, let's not forget Kenya, this is all done in the 50s. So the United States kind of took over from that. So when the French got defeated in 1954 in Vietnam, the Americans took over that operation and the Americans took over a lot of the military operations from the British. Now we can still see there's a close coordination. Yes, they kind of bicker and they fall out, especially over Libya and Iraq. There was some uh, bickering uh, particularly in Libya between the US and UK, but there's a coordination here. So the United States, in terms of its military prowess, is the leading imperialist power after the Suez Crisis in the 50s. I don't think the U US is uniquely violent. I think the fact that they're a sole superpower means they act in a unique way as of this point in history. If Britain or France had the level of power that America had, so relatively, let's say 100 years ago, they had similar, um, similar superpower status and they acted in just as malevolent ways. Britain had an em empire which was a third of the world. It's just that in this international system that we've got after World War II, uh, empire is really out, so you're now looking at neo-imperial relationships. So if you put other countries, other imperialistic countries like Britain and France in the position that America are in, they would act in similar ways. The Council on Foreign Relations, Mika Zenko, added up the Defence Department's own data on airstrikes and revealed in 2016 alone the Obama administration dropped over 26,000 bombs. That's 72 bombs a day dropped on combatants or civilians, or three bombs every hour. 24 hours a day. While most were dropped in Syria and Iraq, US bombs also fell on people in Afghanistan, Libya, Yemen, Somalia and Pakistan. 
also Obama bombed seven Muslim-majority countries, killing many thousands of Muslim civilians, including many hundreds of children. We asked, should Obama be tried for war crimes, and would he be convicted? If he had his hands in something illegal as far as bombing Muslim countries for no reason, yes. Just like anybody else who considers himself to be a politician or, um, you know, military general, whoever it is, it doesn't matter. Um, if it's wrong, it's wrong. War is not the answer. I feel like there's definitely other things that we can do, you know, coming together and talking and figuring out what's the best, oops, sorry, solution, solution, you know, for the situation that doesn't involve death, that doesn't involve killing innocent people, and especially children. I think that that is not necessary, and it's, it's just not, it's not okay with me. Well, I don't believe that. I don't think he is guilty of, of war crimes or killing hundreds of innocent civilians. Uh, there are certain collateral damage, deaths in any kind of bombing or war. Uh, certainly he's not a war criminal. He's certainly not guilty of, of war crimes or uh, crimes against humanity. He's guilty of negligence and weakness in terms of foreign policy in the critical sense. That's what he's guilty of. And uh, again, he's done some very good things domestically but they get wiped out if you leave the country in this kind of state. And quite frankly, we think his weakness has led to Trump. He has planted the seeds that have come to fruition in the candidacy and the election winning of Donald Trump and the defeat of Hillary Clinton. That's a terrible result. It's a terrible result. This country's gonna pay dearly for it, I'm afraid. I don't think he should be charged for war crime because it's war. I mean, it's going to be casualties everywhere. I mean, in that case, everybody should be charged uh, a war crime. I mean, every government. Well, there is, again is another delicate instrument. Uh, war in itself is a is a concept that most people can't wrap their minds around. The killing of women and children is a horrible thing in any country, Muslim to Muslim. You know, uh, American to Muslim. You know, it really doesn't matter what the culture is. Do I think? He's personally culpable, like any other leader. I think there is some culpability, but at the same time, I think it, once again, it comes back to society. We have to learn, learn to, to have tolerance for one another. Yeah, just go back to the war crimes thing. No, he hasn't committed any war crimes, are you kidding me? That's just, that's ridiculous even to ask somebody. I mean, he hasn't done anything. He hasn't, he didn't go over there and kill babies or anything like that. I mean, if you go back and look at uh, My Lai in Vietnam, those were war crimes. I think every, President, every British Prime Minister and their cabinet office should be put on trial for war crimes of previous centuries, including administration today and previously. These are war criminals. These are leading uh, 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 instigators of crimes against humanity. We're, we're talking now about the total destruction of countries. And so absolutely, but we need the power to do that. And so the Global South must unite if it's going to find the capacity. At the moment, we can't even defend our small little countries. How are we going to put these guys on trial? So that's the challenge. If you've got to evaluate Obama being tried for war crimes, you have to evaluate what happened before him. So an international court like The Hague would have to try Bush or Blair in terms of numbers and in terms of severity of war crimes. And only with reference to that case being concluded could you then make the case that Obama has got war crimes to answer for. Of course, he has got blood on his hands. He increased the amount of drones a sevenfold from Bush. But in relation to the amount of people he killed and the amount of carnage that he was personally responsible for, it still pales in comparison to Bush and Blair. Under Obama's presidency, terrorism spread, and the Middle East suffered more chaos and divisions than when he claimed his opposition to the invasion of Iraq. How would the public summarize Obama's presidency and legacy? I think he saved the United States from going into a deep, deep recession. Uh, from an international perspective, I think, as with any of our, our presidents in the past, it needs a lot of work. Um, I think we could build relations, especially with uh, the uh, countries in the Middle East, and I think they need to do so and work towards peace. Well, I saw his legacy 
like every president, they they all have something they have to um, over you know over to achieve, to achieve, and I believe that so far he did really well. And um, as you know, not everyone's perfect. You can't satisfy everybody. Um, so I just believe that you know he can he just did the best he can. So I mean, like the next president, he's gonna have to get over that hurdle too, and this tough decisions all year round. So I don't think that his presidency has been marked by it. But it's definitely something that has been dealt with uh, his presidency and before, and I'm sure that we'll be de dealing with in the future. We think his legacy is one of great disappointment. It's been one of serious weakness in a critical area of foreign policy, national defense, Amen. and fighting back in Syria uh, and in Afghanistan and Iraq. He has been consumed with this idea of withdrawal. It's almost pacifism. <laughs> we wonder if, if Obama isn't a secret Quaker. He is so reticent on those issues. People blame him for the spread of ISIS and terrorism, but that would have happened regardless. I mean, you have, you used to have bad people in the world who need to be killed. That's what it comes down to. And whether or not you think he's responsible for that, I don't think is is right to blame him for that because you know there's always going to be people who hate america and hate what we have in this awesome awesome country but um as far as his legacy goes i think it's just one of great ideas but not enough action okay. and not enough uh, you know not doing the right things to enact those ideas okay. So Obama's legacy and presidency, I think uh, Muammar Gaddafi, the martyr, summed it up the best. He said it's the son of Africa who's come to stab me in the back. So I think that's the most kind of striking legacy that o Obama leaves. However, Trump is picking up the baton from Obama and he's out to, k to kill the Muslims in this great civilizational project with Putin. So let's see how that goes. <laughs> Overall, he hasn't achieved a legacy because what he set out to do, he couldn't achieve. He wanted to go into Syria in 2013, and he set a red line. When it was alleged that Assad had used chemical weapons, he, he was gearing for intervention, but Vladimir Putin outflanked him and said, we'll oversee the destruction of his chemical weapons to avoid, ultimately, a regime change. So he couldn't do what he wanted to do in Syria, and with regards to uh, Israel and Palestine, all he achieved over eight years was a nine-month settlement freeze at the beginning of his presidency. So you could again look at it as if Netanyahu outflanked him. The only thing that he did achieve, and it does have profound consequences, is he did or was part of achieving a nuclear deal with Iran. And that really is the silver lining of his reign in the Middle East because... Had he not achieved that deal, Iran would be a prime target for Donald Trump. You'd see the propaganda absolutely ramping up against Iran, and you'd probably be seeing all of the neocons, whether it's the Democrat Party or the Republican Party, looking to uh, achieve military intervention in Iran. In 2016, US military special forces were in seven out of 10 of Earth's nations. That's 138 countries, 130% up on the Bush administration. Yet after eight years of fighting on many fronts, terrorism has spread, no wars have been won, and the Middle East is more chaotic and divided than when candidate Obama opposed the invasion of Iraq. Obama has been the president often portrayed by Washington commentators as a diplomatic and intellectual pacifist. However, his actions show that he has actually been a hawk, a drone warrior in chief, breaking records by being at war longer than any US president in history. A legacy barely reported, but not forgotten in the countries where American bombs have killed so many. <laughs>